from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ayotunde Balogo. Tonight, Police Service Commission suspends Deputy Commissioner of Police Abba Kiari on the recommendation of the Inspector General of Police over his alleged link with Hush Puppies fraud case. Eight people killed after suspected armed herders launch attacks on two communities in Basa, local government area of Plateau State. Two of the abducted students of the Federal Government College, Bernan Yauri in Kebi State, rescued by the police in Zafara State. And tensions mount as Iran and Israel trade accusations over an attack on Israeli ship of Oman that killed two crew members on Thursday. Plus, sports news. The dust raised by a United States court indictment of a Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abba Kiari, in the fraud case involving Rahman Abbas, popularly known as Hush Puppy, continues to spread. And in a swift response to the matter, the Police Service Commission has already suspended Mr. Kiari, who is head intelligence response team of the Nigeria Police, from the exercise of the powers and functions of his office. His suspension took effect from July the 31st, 2021, and will subsist pending the outcome of the investigation in respect of his indictment by the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the United States. The Commission has also directed the Inspector General of Police to furnish it with information on further development on the matter for further action. The decision of the Police Service Commission follows the IGP Usman al Khali Baba's recommendation for the immediate suspension of DCP Abba Kiari from the service of the Nigeria Police pending the outcome of an ongoing internal investigation touching on him. The police boss, in a letter to the Police Service Commission, noted that the recommendation for the suspension of the officer is in line with the internal disciplinary processes of the force. Meanwhile, the Commission says it holds no position over the allegations against Abba Kiari until all investigations are concluded. The Commissioner in charge of media, Austin Brimer, explains that with the decision that Mr. Kiari proceed on suspension, it will then pave the way for the Commission to critically look into all allegations. Mr. Brimer said this in an interview with Channels Television. It has become the trend that most of our crime fighters have, uh, in one way or another, always ended up in the negativity. It is so sad. But uh, it is not right, too, for us to uh, jump at conclusion that uh, he's guilty because he has not been tried under Nigerian laws yet. And I think we have so many uh, hurdles we need to cross before we conclude that um, uh, DCP Abakiari is actually guilty. Yes, uh, we've heard the allegation that the U.S. court has indicted him. We could add that uh, he was not only indicted, well, he's been asked an arrest warrant was issued. And, um, but not from uh, not yet from a Nigerian court or our judicial system. We need to subject that and um, to the, the, the indictment to our own system and to be sure that, um, yes, he is actually guilty of uh, those offenses. And if, if he's found guilty, it's very unfortunate. And I, I also trust that he will lie with the Attorney General of the Federation while doing this to get the substance, to arrive at the legal substances of these accusations and then to, to establish the culpability of the officer in charge or consign. And uh, I'm also sure that by the time he gets these facts right, he's going to refer the matter to the Police Service Commission that uh, whose authority it is to, to, to punish. And uh, for now, the, the IGP is we are selected properly, and I think we are satisfied with uh, the decision has taken and what it's doing. Uh, punishments for for crimes vary. When a police officer commits infractions on the, on the service code, so the warning, then a reprimand, severe reprimand, reduction in rank, and outright dismissal. These are the the the, the penalties that we can impose on any serving officer on the rank, rank of deputy inspector general of police to uh, a constable in the police. To security now, it's another tale of a deadly attack on Basa local government area of Plateau State in north-central Nigeria 
where eight persons are feared killed in two villages of Zanwa and in Chitao of Miango district by suspected armed herders. It was gathered that the attackers invaded the villages last night, killing four people in their homes and leaving others injured, while another four bodies were recovered from the surrounding bush today. Two persons are set to be in critical condition with gunshot wounds and are expected to undergo operations to remove the bullets lodged in their abdomen. However, the police in the statement explained that the command received a report of a conflict between gunmen suspected to be Fulani militia and youth from Irigwe, which led to the death of four natives with 50 houses burnt. It adds that the commissioner of police, accompanied by other senior officers of the command, has already visited the scene and ordered investigation into the incident. Meanwhile, two of the abducted students of the Federal Government College, Burning Yauri in Kebi State, have been rescued by the police in Zamfara state. The commissioner of police in the state, Hussein Irabiu, said that the two abducted students were rescued by police tactical team and operatives of Puff Ada under Operation Restore Peace in Babandoka village around the forest in Maru local government in, in the Maru local government area of the state. That's in the forest of Dansadao district. Now, on June the 17th this year, bandits invaded the college and kidnapped unspecified number of students in the school. But then, a few days after, the military was able to safely rescue about five of the students. The police have been given details of that rescue. Police uh, tactical operation of and uh, of other now called Operation Rescue Peace, who were deployed in Nansado, were able to rescue one Mariam Abdukari, uh, he is 15 years old, from Mushishi local government of Niger State. And the boy, Farouk, who had a 17-year-old boy of Wara in uh, Wara local government area of the state. They were rescued in uh, the Bandoka village of El Sado Emirates, Maru local government area of for a state. Investigation was conducted and it was it revealed that the rescue victims were among the adopted students of Federal Government College, Yahoo Kelly State. Among the solutions that have been preferred to tackle insecurity in the country is the use of mercenaries. But Nigeria's former Chief of Defense Staff, General Martin Luther Agwai, says the country has no need of such. The General says officers and men serving and retired from the military are perfectly capable of successfully handling the task. He told Channels Television's Ladi Akeri Duluale on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that mercenaries have a different focus that is detrimental to national peace and sustainable national security. By the time you go to that area, I think you are acting out of desperation. That is me. Because what anything private, why do you set it? The main aim is not for, uh, is not for uh, social service. It's not for humanitarian service. It's commercial. So you are commercialized. <laughs> your defense, you are commercialized the life of your human being. You give a target, all the person is interested, it doesn't matter. Remember that if any, and that is why your argument is very important to the counter argument, they will not come in and say, Here we are, we are mercenaries from X country, or we are mercenaries from X organization. They are coming under the umbrella of your forces. And because they are there for commercial purpose, finish their job and get their money and go. Anybody that comes along, whether a, 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 a mistakenly a woman, pregnant woman comes along that will spoil their day, they will get, get rid of her and go. There's no morality. There's no human, human feeling. It's all commercial. I am saying 
that this country have enough knowledgeable, professionally sound uh, officers, both serving and retired, that given that task, they will do it. For the full interview with General Martin Luther Aguay, do watch Newsnight tomorrow, Monday, 2nd of August, 2021, at 9 p.m., right here on Channels Television. Against the growing concerns over transborder banditry, which has continued to threaten national security, the Nigeria Immigration Service says it has deployed technology to tackle illegal entry into the country through the various borders. This was disclosed by the Area Controller of Immigration in Ugun State, at a stakeholders forum on zero tolerance for corruption. He also asked the public to always pass through approved channels when seeking the services of the command to avoid sharp practices. Insecurity is a state of being open to danger or threat and lacking protection. All well, this is what is now associated with much of the country, no thanks to the prevailing wave of attacks, kidnapping and of course killings. This report revisits this naughty issue that appears to defy solutions. A very complex situation indeed. Countless literature has been written about it. Debates have been held on it. There was broad consensus across everyone that things are not working. We need to do this for this for our country to, to, to work better. And uh, it's not about President Muhammad Buhari, it's the National Assembly that ought to take this and move, move it forward. Of course, President Muhammad Buhari can sponsor executive bills uh, uh, for that to happen, but uh, he doesn't need to. More lamentable than these is that lives have been lost and livelihoods destroyed. Insecurity has for years been an issue the nation has found difficult to resolve. Across the country, there are various crimes that are now peculiar to states and regions. In Lagos, cases of robberies and traffic have become a common occurrence. Reports of bank robberies are heard of in states like Oshun, Ikiti, Kwara, and Edo. When they destroy farm finish, they go like the bush for a fire. In the east, arson and attacks on government assets and security agents made the news for some time. Several states up north record deadly attacks by bandits and armed herders, a situation that has reared its head in some other states in the south. A July 2018 report carried out by the International Crisis Group estimates that from September 2017 through June 2018, the farmer herder violence has left at least 1,500 people dead, many more wounded and about 300,000 displaced, an estimated 176,000 in Benue, about 100,000 in Nasarawa, over 100,000 in Plateau, about 19,000 in Taraba, and an unknown number in Adamawa. Another report sourced from Amnesty International in December of 2018 puts the figure of those killed that year at 3,641. As the crisis continues in 2021, so does the number of the dead. Kidnapping is also a means by which criminals hold sway, with schools and highways being major targets. So, what can be done to stop this? By now, we need to have a developer strategy on kidnap. How do we deal with things like that? Um, are the police properly motivated? I doubt it. They're not well motivated. They're not ill-trained. They, um, they don't have enough weaponry. On a medium term, you need to employ a lot more people. You need to train them in modern policing techniques. You need to motivate them adequately. The call for state police to boost the existing police apparatus has been resounding for some time and the insistence of the creation of Amotekun by Southwest governors and Ibu Beagu by their counterparts in the East to counter security challenges shows how frustrating the situation has become. The ultimate wish of the people is that all security agencies, in whatever form, should not give way to those who want to create an atmosphere where fear, violence and death become the order of the day. In part two, after the break, we'll have more on the state of insecurity across the country. Plus, human rights lawyer Femi Falano slams decision by the Kaduna State Government to file fresh charges against the leader of the proscribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki. Do join us again.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Police Service Commission suspends Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abba Kiari, on the recommendation of the Inspector General of Police over his alleged link with Hosh Poppy's fraud case. Eight people killed after suspected armed herders launch attacks on two communities in the Basa local government area of Plateau State. Two of the abducted students of the Federal Government College, Berna Yauri in Kebi State, rescued by the police in Zamfara State. And tensions mount as Iran and Israel trade accusations over an attack on an Israeli ship off Oman that killed two crew members on Thursday. Human rights lawyer Mr. Femi Falano has described as malicious the filing of a new charge by the Kaduna state government against the leader of the proscribed Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki. The state high court had last week dismissed the eight count charge of conspiracy and culpable homicide brought against Sheikh El Zagzaki and his wife following the December 2015 clash between his followers and soldiers in Zaria, which claimed many lives. But in a statement today, the senior advocate of Nigeria condemned the action of the Kaduna state government, saying that the new charge was hurriedly filed in the Federal High Court Kaduna on July the 26th in a desperate bid to frustrate the release of the defendants from further incarceration. He says under the new charge, the Kaduna state government seeks to subject the defendants to trial under the Terrorism Prevention Act enacted in 2011 for offences that were committed as far back as 2008. In the words of Mr. Femi Falano, the new charge constitutes the worst abuse of the process of the Federal High Court. Once the case charge is served on the defense, we shall not hesitate to file the necessary application for the immediate termination of the prosecutorial charade. Now, he insists that the new charge has no effect whatsoever on the valid and subsisting order of the Justice Corrada for the unconditional release of the defendants from prison custody and has called on the Kaduna State government to discontinue it without any delay. The federal government will be receiving 4,080,000 doses of Moderna COVID-19 vaccines on Monday, that's August the 2nd. According to the executive director of the Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Dr. Faisal Schweib, the consignment is a donation from the American government. The expected shipment will be the largest of vaccines received since the COVID-19 vaccination campaign started in Nigeria in March this year. Meanwhile, the other state government says it will not be caught unawares this time by the coronavirus pandemic which adversely affected the state and is now threatening a third wave with the Delta variant, which is fast spreading across the country. To this end, the state government has reactivated its main COVID-19 response center, the Stella Obasanjo Hospital in Benin City, which also contains the largest isolation center in the state. Governor Godwin Obasaki made this known after inspecting some facilities, including the oxygen equipment inside the isolation center at the hospital. Uh, as you have read from the news, the Delta variant of uh, COVID is you know, here with us. And as we're going to inform the press in the next uh, few days, we are beginning to see an increasing number of cases and it's becoming worrisome. But as usual, we need to undertake a thorough analysis and study of the situation and use the data and information which we are gathering to make the decisions we need to make. Um, and one of the decisions that we need to make will be the nature and preparedness of facilities to receive patients for treatment in case we find ourselves in the rather unfortunate situation where countries like India or Senegal is now finding itself. As you know, the Delta variant is very, very contagious and it spreads very wide, well, widely. And um, it has a greater impact 
on those who have not been vaccinated. So what we're doing here today is just to check the readiness of the facilities, check the availability of oxygen, and um, make sure that just if we need to move hundreds of patients for treatment, uh, we have the facilities to do so. Well, it's not only a dose state that is wrapping up measures to curtail the third wave of COVID-19. Other states in the country are also putting measures in place to tackle the Delta variant. However, in Kogi state, it appears many of the residents have continued to live in denial. This next report takes a look at the situation in Kogi state. Looking closely at these videos, they look like visuals taken pre-COVID era. These days, it's easy to tell the period when a clip was taken just by looking out for people moving around with face marks or other protocols against the coronavirus. But make no mistakes anyways, as these are current pictures coming from Kogi State. Everyone seemed to be carrying on with business as usual, marketplaces, on the streets, at school playgrounds. There isn't any recognizable form of the very much advocated safety protocols in prevention and spread of the novel coronavirus. But why do they hold on to a different belief system and what may be aiding such an empirical stance despite global and national hues to pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical advisory? I'm 100% in support of this excellency, my governor. We don't believe in it. Uh, we only obey the face marks as a matter of policy. We don't believe in it. Also, when other states of the Federation were on various forms of lockdown and curfew, Kogi State never had one, despite being a confluent location strategic to many interstate travels. Yeah, I heard about it, but I have no witnessed it anywhere, most especially in Kogi State here. But we heard about it, many people talk about it, but I have no witnessed it. That is why I don't believe on it. A quick look at the NCDC chart puts Kogi's number very low. Many will argue that this is attributable to several factors, including rate of testing, reception to NCDC official, and many more. What is also ironic is that whilst the belief system is low, the state says it has recorded a large vaccination number. We are supplied with 53,000 doses, 50,300 doses of the COVID AstraZeneca vaccine in the state. And uh, we were able to vaccinate 43,889 you know, doses so far for the first dose and the second dose alike. Finally, we found someone who dared to be different, though he has some contemplations. They told us where to take the vaccine, but my fear is a lot of uh, video clips are on the net. They show us uh, some people in Asia, some in Malaysia that took the thing, and when you put anything iron, it will be showing, or you put a, a bulb that is not having a cable, put it on that spot where they kept it, before you know, it will on the bulb. So I wouldn't know, that has been my fear. Isn't this a leadership body language? Governor Yahya Bello never said that, never denied the existence of COVID-19. This has to be taken, you know, and that impression need to be corrected. He also never stopped anyone from taking the vaccine. That impression also need to be corrected. All I know he has problem with the commercialization of the COVID-19. Let's check the archives. We should not be deceived again. Enough is enough. We should tell them that they should keep their COVID-19 to themselves. We don't need that market in Nigeria. Vaccines have been produced in less than one year of COVID-19. No vaccine for HIV, malaria, for cancer, for headache, and for several other diseases that are killing us. We don't have vaccine. They want to use the vaccine to introduce the disease. 
that will kill you and us. God forbid. We tried reaching out to front health workers in the state, but none would want to comment on the paradox. The signs, sounds, figures, global reset, everything around the world today is indicative of shift in lifestyle location by COVID-19. If those are anything to go by, it does appear like some danger may be lurking around the corner, and that could raise the appetite of national disease control officials to look again. Operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the NDLEA, have recovered some 35 wraps of cocaine from the underwear of one Okafo Ebere Edith during the clearance of passengers on Air Cote d'Ivoire to Monrovia, Liberia, from the Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos. The suspect, who tucked the pellets of cocaine in her underwear to beat security checks at the airport, was however picked up for search and questioning, during which the wraps of the illicit drug were found on her. During a preliminary interview, she claimed her desire to make money pushed her into drug trafficking. Meanwhile, another suspect, a chain of Jerry Madakulam, a male passenger heading to Istanbul, was arrested at the departure hall of the Murtala Mohammed International Airport during the clearance of Egypt Airline to Turkey with 78 grams of cannabis mixed with dried bitter leaves. The chairman of the NDLEA, Brigadier General Mohamed Buba Marwa, have commended the officials of the agency for their continued efforts in tracking down traffickers of illicit drugs in their areas of responsibility. Were you expecting more than this? No. Motorists and commuters usually spend hours in traffic, all owing to uh, traffic congestion in Lagos, Nigeria Southwest. But then more troubling to residents in recent time is the disturbing issue of robbery in traffic gridlock. But the State Police Command says it is now mapping out more strategies to help curb traffic robbery, including raiding suspected criminal hideouts and flashpoints in order to minimize the menace. A recurring nightmare, Lagos traffic congestion, a menace that seems to have overwhelmed relevant government agencies. Statistics available as of 2016 show an estimated 21 million people live in Lagos. But there are no fewer than 5 million vehicles on the roads daily. On a daily basis, the traffic counter picks that Lagos State records an average of 227 vehicles per kilometer of the road. Year in, year out, Lagosians go through harrowing experiences in gridlock. As if that is not enough, traffic robbers exploit the situation to carry out their nefarious activities. With no definite destination, they look around areas prone to traffic jam and sometimes at bad spots, waiting to strike. With a barrage of complaints from different quarters, the Lagos State Police Command agrees that the lead agency in traffic management has to take the bull by the horn. The traffic robbery has gone down drastically. They have not gotten there. Though there's no, there's no society without crime. But uh, we're still intensifying. We've gotten one leg to that. I've tackled one leg to that. But there are still maybe one north or there. And one of the strategies we are employed to is the massive raid we carried out. But the strategy we are employed is just to de deploy more men, knowing the time, when the traffic is always on, and make sure that police officers are on the field. With a tactical team formed, the state police boss says the fight against traffic robbery would be intensified, especially with the procurement of logistics and combat equipment by the Lagos state government for the command. We have re-strategized. So the area where we have all these uh, elements coming up in the morning, we have. We have changed our timing of deployments. And that's why we see many people on the road. Because probably traffic does not happen only when they are coming back from work. When they are going to work in Lagos, there is traffic. More so now that there is a lot of reconstruction road that is going on. So with that one now, you know there is bound to be traffic. And we have just to that. While the command appears to be doing its best to address this worrisome trend with constant raids and arrests, 
One expects the judiciary to corroborate this effort with speedy trial of those arrested. And when the news at 10 returns, one person reported killed in an attack on the Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria in Ibadan, the Oyo state capital. Join us again. Welcome back. One person has been killed in an attack on the Federal Road Corporation or the Federal Radio Corporation of Niger in Ibadan, the capital of Oyo State. Now, according to the police, the victim was a member of a criminal gang who had visited the premises of the radio station for a reprisal on a local vigilante group. Both groups were reported to have clashed at Shasha in the Ojo area of the state. It was gathered that the group reassembled to launch an attack on the vigilante group, which uses the premises of the radio station as its secretariat. Angered by the absence of the vigilante group members, the criminal gang went berserk. Four vehicles were said to have been vandalized within the premises of the media outfit. Commuters plying the Bochi Kano Highway have been thrown into a difficult situation following a failed portion on the road caused by flood, which claimed three lives on Friday. The travelers had to disembark from their vehicles and continue their journey on foot to board a different vehicle in order to get to their various destinations. Meanwhile, the state governor, Bala Mohamed, who has already visited the area, has directed immediate rehabilitation of the road in order to bring relief to travelers there. Our correspondent, Hajara Ali, tells us more. The downpour on Friday created a ditch in the middle of the Bochikano Highway. This has made driving on the road nearly impossible. The area has been turned into a temporary motor park where passengers are exchanged from both ends as travelers make their way across by foot to board another vehicle. <laughs> Motorists are warned of the danger ahead as they approach the washout. <laughs> It's brisk business for commercial motorcycle operators who convey passengers to and fro, especially those with excessive luggage. The Bochi state governor Bala Muhammad has come to assess the damage firsthand. He is not comfortable with the temporary solution proposed by FEMA. I know of the federal government policy which says that states are not allowed to do federal government responsibility because they will not be refunded. But this is an emergency program and we know that Mr. President is the president of the people, he has said it, and the people of Bochi love him, especially in this area, and that is why we are calling on him to please give a leeway for us to be able to provide solution. The governor also visited the Ankari quarters in Bochi Metropolis, which has constantly been affected by flood. Residents had protested the blockage of the water channel by a fence erected by the DSS, but the governor also queried illegal construction of houses on waterways. People are building on the plot drain and you expect a miracle to happen. You have been selling land to people to build on the plot drain. Go. Come here. What kind of thing is this? How do you expect these people to survive? This man. It can be possible. It is not about this world. Governor Mohammed directs the Ministry of Works to embark on demolition of houses built on waterways and ensure that the people are compensated. He also instructed that other highways affected by flood be fixed immediately. Hajara Aliyu, Channels Television News. From Bochi, let's head to Rivers, where five days of protest by youth in the state over the condition of the LMA on air access of the East West Road in River State. While well, the chairman of LMA local government area has announced the suspension of the action. Or the follows, or this follows, the mobilization of contractors to begin the reconstruction of the 15-kilometer stretch of the road by the Federal Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs. 
Addressing journalists after confirming the deployment of civil engineering equipment to the site, the LMA Council chairman warned that a more serious protest will be staged if the progress of work is slow or the contract is abandoned. On Friday, the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Godwin Apabio, announced the release of 2.5 billion naira for the commencement of work and prevailed on the youth to end the protest. As the executive chairman of this local government and the chief security officer of the local government, I hereby declare this protest suspended. The protest is suspended because we want to be sure that the project will be carried out to its completion. Because this is not a time when anybody will play gimmicks with the people of our local government. In Taraba State, Governor Dara Shishaku is asking the unemployed youth to join hands with him to eradicate ghost workers instead of taking to the streets to protest fees imposed on job application forms into the state civil service. This is coming as the state government lifted the embargo on employment 28 years after the creation of the state. The government is asking each applicant to purchase the form at the rate of 3,500 naira, a situation that has led to protests by the youth. For the first time since the creation of Taraba State out of the defunct Gongola State in August 1991, the state government has lifted the embargo placed on employment. It has commenced enrollment of applicants into the state civil service and is also trying to fill the vacuum created by the retirement of civil servants by calling for transfer of service from the federal and local government employees into the state civil service. The first phase of the employment exercise we are witnessing today is to issue employment letters to more than 300 successful applicants. However, some unemployed youths see the exercise as a sham, especially the request by the State Civil Service Commission for applicants to purchase the forms with the sum of 3,500 naira. While they are demanding that the exercise should be free, the chairman of the commission says the fees demanded is legally backed. The Taraba State Government should, number one, refund all the payments made by those who have bought the phone by now. Then, number two is to make the entire process free. Government uh, carries out his services through levies, taxes, and so on. So this money is part of the uh, levies, taxes that government collects and is legal. Governor Darius Ishako on this part says their agitation holds no water as it prefers employing more hands to fill vacancies rather than sacking workers to pay the national minimum wage. I would rather continue to manage the 100,000 workers with what I am giving them and speak to their conscience to know that I cannot afford an addition and maintain them than to sack them. But you say you are going to strike and I have ghost workers I'm fighting with. You are not coming to help me fight the ghost workers. So what have you gained? No. The state government is also insisting that youths across the state should embrace agriculture as a means of livelihood, noting that agriculture has employed 65% of its over 2 million population and has huge impact on the state's economy. And now to the arts. Colors of the Uprising as an exhibition that showcases the collection of artists who gathered at the Posh Gallery in Lagos to share their creative thoughts on how cultural values speak to them. Colors of the Uprising is a group exhibition at the Posh Gallery, Lagos. But the organizers spiced up this sip and paint party 
by allowing four of the exhibiting artists demonstrate what they usually do in their studio, draw or paint. For my life drawing, as you can see behind, this is early stages of the next series that I'm working on. So just to while away time and to in involve other people in the journey of this new creation, I decided to start the process at this event. But with time, I guess for the next show coming up soon, everybody will have the chance to see the finished work. But so far, the early stages will also be quite, quite interesting, and if you, if it could pass, some people could just see that as art already, as far as I've gone. The idea behind the exhibition is to reveal the young artists making waves in the Nigerian creative industry. So the title of this work here is Once Upon a Time in Maniata, and I got my inspiration from the Maasai culture in, in Kenya. So um, basically, I fell in love with their costumes, or we like to say their traditional attire, the suka and their beautiful, colorful bees. So while I was doing my research, I found a lot of information about the Maasai woman. So I found out that the, the Maasai woman has no right to education. So I wanted to, I wanted to make a work that, you know, shows, shows this aspect of their tradition. The works describe the mood and feelings that I went through and a lot of us also went through during the pandemic period. We, we found ourselves, we embraced different aspects of our lives. Things changed, but we, we adapted to it. One unique uh, feature of the human mind is adaptation. So for the work emergence um, behind me and left, uh, I, that that um, there I capture everybody, every man, every woman who through the pandemic saw get their inner potentials. I tried to use a more generic and biological symbol, which is like the female and male gender symbols. Because if you want to enter a toilet now or any other place, you see men, women, you notice a symbol. So this is the most common and biological one used. So with it, I used to express and highlight the friendship among ladies and societal issues such as mental health, the burden of inescapable responsibilities we experience. Eleven artists exhibit over 50 works of art that marry beauty with brains at this gallery in Lagos. Well, earlier on in the news at 10, we brought you a report on the state of insecurity across the country, ranging from banditry, kidnappings, and of course, killings. Well, let's get more perspective on the issue, and we are now being joined by a retired intelligence officer with the Nigerian Army, Brigadier General Jejalala Karim from Ibadan, the Oyo State Capital, live. Welcome to the news at 10. Thank you for having me. All right, so what is your assessment of the current security situation in terms of the concerns that Nigerians uh, have uh, over this issue in many parts of the country, talking about insecurity? Well, there is a very good reason for any Nigerian to be apprehensive about the security situation within the country. However, that does not mean the country is living over it. As we can see, a lot of efforts are being put by the government to tackle all the security challenges all over the country. It is pertinent to note that security challenges in a country like Nigeria, which is pluralistic in nature, can never be generic. There are bound to be different security challenges ranging from one zone to the other. There lies a major challenge of the government because various approaches have to be adopted for each of these security challenges for each of these security challenges. So it is not as if that the government is not doing anything. 
But at the same time, Nigerians have good cause to be apprehensive of the situation. Because the livelihood of so many people, so many Nigerians are being affected. We are all aware of the inability of many farmers in the various parts of the country to go to the farm. And there are apprehensions that there might be food shortages as a result of this inability to go to the farm. These are some of the negative consequences of insecurity that we, we have. Even if you look at it from the international perspective, the security situation in the country could affect foreign direct investment, which every country actually crave for, crave for in order to have economic prosperity. So, therefore, there is a genuine cost for Nigerians to be apprehensive of the current insecurity ravaging the country. All right, now you did talk about the efforts made by government in stemming the tide of insecurity, and we know a lot is going on uh, in the works, so that's from the government side. Now, capacity to handle the situation is indeed a, a big issue. Well, there is clearly an, an underwhelming or an overwhelming uh, police force that, which should make any attempt of support, but of course it does look as if that is not really happening. Now, what do you think can be done to get out of this uh, uh, problem, as it were? Well, like I told you, there are so many security agencies in the country. Each is saddled with basic responsibility. Each security agency is expected to perform its own duties while others too perform their own duties. When there is synergy among all the security agencies, the output will be better than if each agency is busy tackling the security challenges on their own in isolation without cooperating or collaborating with other security agencies. So the issue of synergy among the security agencies is very important. Aside from that, is the issue of well-equipped security agencies. Well-equipped. Do they have all the necessary wear with them, the equipment to tackle the security challenges? Aside from that, are the personnel, personnel well-motivated to perform these duties? Are we sure they are not even being subverted by the non-state actors that are responsible for the insecurity within the countries? Because you cannot say these people, these security agencies personnel are Nigerians, and you cannot rule out the idea of they being subverted by these non-state actors that are waging war against the country. So there are so many factors that we have to consider. Collaboration between the security agencies, the personnel being well motivated, including provision of all the requisite equipment to tackle these security challenges. I think all these are critical in the fight against insecurity within the country. Our Brigadier General Jajalala Karim, a retired intelligence officer with the Nigerian Army, we thank you for your thoughts on the news at 10. Thank you so much. The United Nations peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic says six civilians have been killed in a rebel attack in the country's northeast. Now, according to a spokesman for the UN's 12,000-strong MINUSCA mission, several civilians were also wounded in that attack. The situation in Man, some 550 kilometers from the capital Bongi, is now under control and patrols are underway. The attack was carried out by the 3R, one of several armed groups to have emerged in the Central African Republic, which has been murdered in violence since a brutal civil conflict erupted back in 2013. Well, Israel and Iran are trading blame over Thursday's attack on an Israeli ship off Oman that resulted in the death of two crew members, causing tensions to rise between both countries. Israel's Prime Minister says he knows with certainty that Iran was involved in the incident, but Iran has called the claim baseless. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett warned that Israel knows how to send a message to Iran. On the other hand, authorities in Tehran warned that it would not hesitate to defend its interests. Recently, there have been several attacks on Israeli and Iranian-operated ships, which are seen as tit-for-tat incidents. Well, New Zealand's Prime Minister has formally apologized for an immigration crackdown in the 1970s against Pacific Islanders. The dawn raids targeted people who overstayed their visas, deporting them to their countries of origin. They disproportionately affected Pacific Islanders, despite most visa overstayers being from the UK, Australia and South Africa. Jacinda Ardern has now issued a formal and unreserved apology. 
Today, I stand on behalf of the New Zealand Government to offer a formal and unreserved apology to Pacific communities for the discriminatory implementation of the immigration laws of the 1970s that led to the events of the Dawn Raids. The Government expresses its sorrow, remorse and regret that the dawn raids and random police checks occurred and that these actions were ever considered appropriate. Our Government conveys to the future generations of Aotearoa that the past actions of the Crown were wrong and that the treatment of your ancestors was wrong. We convey to you our deepest and sincerest apology. We also apologise for the impact these events have had on other peoples, such as Māori and other ethnic communities who are unfairly targeted and impacted by the random police checks of the time. We acknowledge the distress and hurt that these experiences would have caused. Australia's east coast states of New South Wales and Queensland is facing an escalating battle against the COVID-19 Delta variant with billions under strict lockdown and authorities urging more testing and vaccinations to rein in the outbreaks. Over the past 24 hours, Sydney and its surroundings, under a stay-at-home order for five weeks already, reported 239 new locally acquired cases of the highly infectious Delta strain, matching the record daily number in the current outbreak that was reported on Thursday. Despite not making it past the first game in table tennis event at the Tokyo Olympic Games, Nigeria's Funke Shonaike was celebrated by the International Table Tennis Federation, the IWTF, as a seven-time Olympian. The table tennis enthusiasts have applauded the recognition as a former African champion becomes the first woman in Africa to be inducted as a member of the exclusive club of seven. Taking part in the Olympic Games is every athlete's dream. And this informs the decision of the international sports governing bodies to recognize athletes who are featured at the competition seven times. The International Table Tennis Federation inducts Nigeria's Funke Oshonaike into the exclusive class of Olympians known as Club Seven, following her participation at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. <laughs> Oshanaike becomes the first women athlete in Africa and second Nigerian to be inducted into Club 7 after making that debut at the Atlanta 1996 Games. She joins compatriot Shegun Turiola, who got enlisted in Rio 2016 Olympics, and three others from Sweden, Croatia and Belgium on the exclusive class. <laughs> And back home in Nigeria, mixed reactions have trolled her achievement with appeals to the administrations to groom replacements. I think it's a great one for her career, but a lot of people are saying it's time for her to bow out now, encourage the younger ones to qualify also. But the issue is that how many of them have beaten her in terms of the qualifiers? How many of them have come to say, OK, we have the quality to do better than what Funke Oshaneke has done over the years? Even in Africa, she's one of the best in in the singles event for Africa. It shows that uh, we are doing something positive in Nigeria as regards to table tennis. And uh, I hope with their experience and such a uh, fit, they can also use that to mentor the upcoming ones because that is a critical thing. Being a member of the seventh club is not the end of the whole thing. You need to part back to those that are coming behind you. For us to have two persons in that club shows you that we are not doing badly in table tennis. But I think it should be something that we should work on. Because the younger ones, you look at the performance of Shegu Toriola and uh, Funke Oshonaike and be challenged. Despite its dominance in Africa, Nigeria's performance is still a far cry at the Olympic stage. 
On a rather unfortunate note, Team Nigeria's Enoch Adigoke did not finish his 100 meters final after pulling up injured with what appears to be a hamstring problem shortly after the race started. Great Britain's Hughes Janelle was disqualified from the race after a full start. Now, the race was won by Marcel Jacobs of Italy ahead of American Fred Curley and Andre de Grasse of Canada. Jacobs crossed the line in 9.80 seconds to bring the sprint goal to Italy for the very first time. Venezuela's two-time world champion Yulimar Rojas has set a new world record as she won Olympic gold in the women's triple jump earlier today. Rojas jumped 15.67 meters on her sixth and final jump in Tokyo, smashing the previous best of 15.50 meters set by Ukraine's Inessa Kravitz in 1995. It was the first world record of the Tokyo Olympics athletics program. And the People's Republic of China have maintained firm grip at the top of the medals table after Sunday's events. Well, they have now won 23 gold, 14 silver and 13 bronze medals. That's a total of 51. They are being trailed by the U.S. with 20 gold, 23 silver and 16 bronze. Host Japan have picked a total of 31 medals so far. This includes 17 gold, 5 silver and 9 bronze medals. And the main news again. The Police Service Commission, the PSC, today suspended the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abba Kiari, over his alleged link with fraud case involving Ramon Abbas, also known as Hush Puppy in the United States of America. The suspension was sequel to the recommendation of the Inspector General of Police, Usman al Kali Baba. Also today, reports said eight people were killed after suspected armed herders launched attacks on two communities in Basa, local government area of Plata State last night. And tensions rose today as Iran and Israel traded accusations over an attack on an Israeli ship off Oman that killed two crew members on Thursday. And that's the news at 10. Many thanks for watching. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. From all of us here, it's good night and stay safe.